Good morning, church. Let's uh, rush to God in prayer first thing this morning. What do you think? Lord, we just thank you and praise you for this awesome day. We thank you for the reading of your word with, with Ellen and for the worship that we're able to have. We thank you that you have blessed us so richly that even though we are not worthy to even be in your presence, that you receive us as we are and beckon and call to us to come unto you. And we pray this morning, Lord, as we study your word, that we would receive and follow that beckon and that call and seek you out to change our lives. You be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we are going to be, if you want to turn there into Luke 7 this morning and Mark 6, Luke 7 and Mark 6, and then we'll jump over to another section of scripture, but we'll start there. Ken was telling me this morning that he'd gone out this week and gone hiking up Big Cottonwood Canyon, and I don't know if he shared with anybody else about uh, what happened to a, a guy that he came across up there that... This, the, this guy had fallen off the cliff and it was just he was just in major trouble. He'd fallen about 20 feet down. The only thing that stopped him was this, this root that was hanging out of the, of the, the cliff side. So he was hanging on that and he, Ken, as Ken was walking up there, he got up there a little bit late. But I guess what had happened was the guy had been yelling and yelling and yelling for help. Help, please, someone help me. Because he looked down, it was like a thousand feet straight down. And he knew that he couldn't hold on to that root for very long. He just wasn't in the greatest shape. So he kept yelling for help, and finally, I guess, uh, before Kennel came along, someone did come. And uh, they said, hey, don't worry, can you hear me? And the guy's like, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you, are you there, can you help me? And he's like, yes, I can help you. And he says, where are you, I can't see you. And the voice said, don't worry, I can see you, I'm God. And he says, you're God? He says, yes, I'm God, and I'm here to help you. I just want you to do what I say, and the guy's yelling out, and he goes, please, God, please help me, get me out of here, get me off this place, I'll repent, I'll do whatever, I'll never sin again, and God's like, whoa, 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 let's slow down on the promises, okay, we'll deal with those after I save you, don't overpromise and underdo, just, just let me take care of you, so he says, what do you want me to do, Lord, and the Lord says, just do exactly what I say, I just want you to let go of the root, long pause, he said, what, he said, just let go of the root, I'll save you. Another long pause. And then the man exclaimed, is there anybody else up there? And luckily, Kenno came along and saved him. So we're talking about faith today. Faith, that simple thing, right? It's so simple, right? We all talk about faith. We, we try and live faith. But faith is one of those crazy things that a lot of times we really struggle with. And we'll get into that a little bit. So we're going to have... Uh, we're series se or uh, session seven of our eight part series on the questions that Jesus has questions that he asked to probe into the depths of our soul and spirit into the depths of our life and and cause us to respond to him the stories are to the people in the Bible of course and we know what goes on what happens with them we've read them many times there are no new stories we've bought, we've seen them and we know what happens but as we've gone through the series that we're kind of switching the scenario a little bit that we almost put ourselves in the story, that Jesus is the one asking us the questions, beckoning us to answer, to see where we stand in relationship to him. So we're asking a question about faith today. Before we get there though, have you ever seen something truly amazing? Like Richard Bilton in the chicken coop, right? <laughs> That's what Sarah thinks, right? Something truly amazing. Now, the, the dictionary says that to, ama to be amazed is to be overcome with wonder. Boy, that just sounds so euphoric, doesn't it? To be overcome, overwhelmed with wonder. The problem with us being amazed is that throughout life, we've often become a little calloused and jaded to amazing things, right? I mean, it was lovely to watch Ellen as she was sharing um, Psalm 46 with us, that it was really touching her heart as she was sharing that she was amazed by the Word of God. But oftentimes, we don't stop to be amazed. We don't stop to see the blessings that God has given us because there's so much going on around us. There's noise pollution, there's light pollution, there's air pollution, there's podcasting on signs, there's you know, traffic signs and billboards, there's police chasing us with lights on, well, hopefully not that, but there's all these things going on, there's so many distractions in our world that the things that were invented, like the computer and the cell phone that were all supposed to make our life more simple have really just made it busier, right? And distracting. 
And so it's hard for us to be amazed, but when we are, it's a beautiful thing. Now let me switch that question a little bit. Instead of you being amazed, how would you amaze God? I mean, the one who spoke the world into being. The one who stretched out the sky like a, a velvet canvas and he dipped his fingers in the paintbrush of the world and he made the stars in the sky and the Milky Way across the middle of the night sky. He placed the sun and the moon there for us. How would you amaze the one who scooped out the depths of the oceans with his hand? And he calms the stormy sea. How would you amaze one that just speaks a word and the wind's calm. How would you amaze someone who can speak plainly to an old cup of water so sweetly that it blushes and becomes wine? How would you amaze God? Have you ever thought about that? We know that God's amazing, but as God looks at us, how would you amaze God? How would you amaze someone who walks on water without the aid of a paddleboard or a ski boat? How would you amaze someone who takes a little boy's simple lunch and feeds 5,000? Maybe we should ask this question. Can you amaze God? Is it possible? Yes. Luke 7. Turn with me there to see how you would amaze God. That we can learn likewise how we can amaze God and give him glory. Luke 7 verses 1 to 10 is a well-known story there of Jesus healing a slave. But that's not the amazing part in the story. And that's amazing in itself, isn't it? That the healing is not the amazing part. You see, Jesus healed all the time. But do you ever read in the word that when he healed, he was amazed at his own power? No. He knew what he could do. He was not amazed by it. It was just something practical that he did when it was allowed. But let's read about a man who does amaze Jesus, that we can apply this in our life. Luke 7, starting with verse 1. When he, Jesus, had completed his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. And a centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and was about to what? To die. So this guy is really sick. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. And they came to Jesus and earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this wish for him, for he loves our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. Well, that's an odd start right there, isn't it? A Jewish centurion, or, an, or a Roman centurion who built a Jewish synagogue. It's quite interesting. Verse 6. Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to Jesus, Lord, do not trouble yourself any further, for I am what? I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Man, I really want to know this guy, right? Don't you? He's a Roman. He's not a Jewish individual. He's a Roman. He's built a synagogue for the Jewish people, and he already knows better than most Jews of the authority of Jesus. And he reaches out and says, Lord, I am not worthy have your presence in my house. Verse 7. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but you just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man placed under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him. Another word you could put in for marveled would be what? He was amazed. He was amazed at him, and he turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. And those who had been sent returned to the house, and they found the slave in good health. Wow, that's how you amaze Jesus, is you do what? You enable your faith. You humble yourself before the Lord and live as though God 
is truly God. Turn with me to Mark 6. We're going to read another story of amazing Jesus. Mark 6, verse 1 to verse 6, and it reads, Jesus went out from there and came to his hometown. Now what's interesting about going back home to your old stomping ground? Everybody what? Everybody knows you, right? They grew up with you. They all know you. And if you're like me in that hometown that I grew up in that Tara says is really kind of a little dive of a place when she went to visit it, right? <laughs> Was that the word you used? Weird. Very weird. Well, it shows I'm from there, right? So it, it fits. But when I go back to my hometown, uh, Christy made this observation one time when after we were first married was when I went back to my hometown everyone that was there didn't call me John even though I'm a man now they called me Johnny and she's like why did they call me Johnny you know and it's like well that's what I grew up with and that's what they call so you go back to your hometown everybody what knows you so Jesus went out from there and came to his hometown and the disciples followed him and when the Sabbath came he began to teach in a synagogue and many listeners were astonished saying where did this man get these things and what is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as these performed by his hands now notice this verse 3 is this not who the carpenter the son of Mary the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon are not his sisters here with us and they did what they took offense at him. What an interesting thing. The thing about my small town that motivated me to leave was once you graduated high school, you were in either this group or you were in this group. And you never got out of your group as long as you lived there. The only way to get out of the group that they put you in in that little town, that little clique, was to leave. But when you would come back, they would instantly do what? Put you back in the group, no matter how successful or unsuccessful you had been. And so they took offense at Jesus, and they're like, he's just the carpenter's son. What is he doing? First, they're amazed, but it's like, he can't be doing this. They've already prejudged him. He can't do these things. He's just Joseph's son, the carpenter. What is going on? And so instead of being amazed, their amazement turns to what? being offended because certainly he can't do something miraculous he's just Joseph's kid that's all and Jesus said to them a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household that's why they say in marriage retreats if you want to know what a husband's really like ask his wife right it's very convicting because she's seen him all those years and she'll respond honestly right Verse 5, and he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he, what? Marveled. He marveled. He wondered. He was amazed at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages and teaching. Well, now there's our two story about how do you amaze Jesus. But one of these stories is Sesame Street, what? Not, not like the either. other right one of these these two stories are different they're opposing stories and yet in both stories they're amazed in the first story Jesus is amazed at the Roman centurion for what his, faith. his great faith his humility his realization of the authority of God and his unworthiness to stand before God man if I could only grasp that all those days of my life life would be a whole lot better right there's moments I grasp it, but then there's this issue called pride and short man syndrome that often gets in the way for me, right? But he was amazed, marveled, wondered at the centurion's great faith, and he even turned around and looked at the crowd to express his amazement and said, I have not found such great faith in all of Israel. Well, we just take that as a statement, but how do you think the Jews receive that? That'd be a slap in the face, right? I mean, he just bluntly looked and said, this guy's got and understands and does what you should be doing, but are not. And he was amazed. 
In the second story, he's amazed to find not great faith, but weak faith, or probably more, what? No faith. Among the Jewish people of his own hometown. These were people who should have had a predisposition to believe in God from the very beginning because they always went back and said, Our father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we are our forefathers' children, and we are God's chosen people, and we serve God. And yet, they had no faith. So a couple quick questions for us to bring this home and make it practical, right? We love questions in church, right? They hit us where we're at. If Jesus came to your house, what would he expect to find in the way of faith, and what would he find? Would he be amazed at you or not? If Jesus came to our church this morning, would he be amazed? And in which way would he be amazed? At our great faith or at our weak or lack of faith? You see, what God wants most from people is not morality, which is what? Keeping rules of strict personal propriety? I mean, we see that littered throughout the Old Testament. I mean, David was fooling around. I mean, other people were doing things and all kinds of stuff in the Old Testament. But God is a forgiving God. So what he wanted from them was not per se their morality because he knew that they would fail. And he knew that he could forgive. What about their orthodoxy? Believing and teaching good biblical doctrine. Well, they tried, but the problem was they couldn't really live it out all the time, right? So he wasn't amazed by their intellect of how much theology they knew. In fact, we've looked several times where Theolo theolo theological lawyers would confront him. Very intelligent men knowing the word of God and he would confront them back. What about their, a word we don't use very often, if ever at all, their orthopraxy. You know what orthopraxy is, right? Stuff you get in between your teeth, right? And you gotta get some floss. No. <laughs> it's observing rituals or worship exactly in prescribed ways. Well, when we have our work, order of worship, we come in, we do this, we do this, we do this. You know, when we sing and pray songs, we do this, right? Watch some videos. Watch some videos, yeah. No, he, the Jewish people worshiped all the time. And that didn't amaze Jesus. What amazed God, what amazed Jesus, was faith. Either great faith found in humility, understanding the authority of God, or complete lack of faith which just boggled his mind. I mean, I look out in our world, our chaotic culture, and sometimes I look and I'm like, how can they even believe or do what they're doing? And then I have to go back and realize it's a spiritual issue. That if you're entrenched in sin and don't have salvation, you can't understand the things of God, right? I mean, you can kind of intellectually understand them, but they don't ring home in your soul and spirit. Great faith really amazed Jesus. But I think lack of faith or no faith exasperated him. I mean, here he is... God incarnate, God come into flesh to save his creation, and they lovingly rejected him with violence and murder, right? I mean, if you can imagine him looking saying, I, I created you, I've come to save you from yourselves and from sin, I've come to make you perfect, and you don't even believe? Jesus often said in the New Testament, oh, you of what kind of faith? Little faith. Or how long must I put up with you? I mean, when Jesus made those statements, we knew that he wasn't happy about the situation. It's like, Father, how much time do I have to be rejected by them? They're just not getting it. It exasperated Jesus. But great faith, humble faith, amazed him in a good way, where he would turn around to the crowd and say, take note of this individual. Pay attention to him because this man has got it right. Well, let's read another story. 
the last story about faith. We'll find our question of Jesus in the story. Turn back to Luke 18 as we read the first eight verses. It's the, par the parable of the persistent widow. This widow who would what? Not give up with the judge. We've read the story, right? She just keeps coming back to him and back to him and back to him and back to him until it exasperates him and drives him crazy, right? Luke 18, verse 1. Now Jesus was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to <coughs> pray. pray and not to lose heart. lose heart. Saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. Well, how do we know that? Well, one, Jesus tells us, but then we're going to read it later. The man's going to say it himself. Verse 3. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him. I think those words should be highlighted and in double font, right? She kept coming to him. In other words, she kept coming and coming and coming and coming to this judge, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. And for a while he was unwilling, but afterwards he said to himself, I do not fear God or respect man. See, that's how we know that, right? Makes sense, right? He tells us. Yet because this widow, what? Bothers me. I've lived through this. You've lived through this, right? Anybody who's ever had children has lived through this. Why? 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 No, 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 right? And you're just like, oh. But he says in verse 5, because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming to me, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, hear what the righteous judge said now. Judge. The unrighteous judge, thank you. Well, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry out to him day and night? And he will delay long over them. And I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. Here comes our questions, kids. However, when the Son of Man comes, what's our question? Will he find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man comes, when Jesus returns, will he find faith on the earth? Hebrews 11.6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who earnestly do one thing, seek him. Romans 8.32 says, He did not spare his own son, speaking of God the Father, but freely gave him up for all. Will he not also among those with him graciously give all things? John 14.12-14 tells us, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. If anyone has faith in me and will do what I have been doing, he will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Well, faith is slightly important, isn't it? What's our response to faith? Well, I have my doubts. I'm just not sure. I just don't have enough faith to follow through, right? I mean, if God only gave me more faith, I mean, don't we read the story about the apostles coming to Jesus and say, Lord, do what? Increase our faith. Frederick Bonhoeffer, that great preacher and theologian, wrote this about doubts in faith. It's very deep and theological. I want you to catch this. This is by a very well-known, learned, smart, intellectual theologian. He said, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They will keep it awake and moving. Besides, Jesus said that when it comes to faith, it only takes this much. Doubts are like the ants in the pants of faith. You ever have ants in your pants? I mean, you're moving, you're doing stuff, but you're not going anywhere, right? You're just kind of staying in the same spot. You're just there. And then Dietrich Bonhoeffer went on to say, it only takes this much faith, please God, Luke 17, 5 to 6 says, The disciples said to Jesus, Increase our faith. And Jesus replied, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, and those of you good cooks know how big a mustard seed is, it's like what? That 
He says, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it will obey you. If you only have this much faith, it will do it. Faith is easy, right? Or is it? We all are given a measure of faith and salvation. And truth is, we don't need what? More faith. We have enough for what Jesus has called us to do. He always gives us enough. We simply need to learn how to activate and practice the faith that God has given us. And so in closing, when we deal with our question of when, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? I want to give us four practical steps to remind ourselves how to activate our what? Our faith. If for no other reason, because faith amazes God. And I think that's a good thing, right? Number one, decide to believe. Well, that's profound, isn't it? But it's serious. The greatest optical obstacle to faith is usually not in the mind. You know that? It's not in the mind. It's in the discipline to follow through with what you've decided in the mind. So you've got to decide to believe. It's like, I am going to have faith. God tells me to have faith. I'm going to have faith. And then with that faith, I'm going to practice it. I'm going to have the discipline to follow through. Just settle in your heart to believe in God. Because the temptation to be cynical and fall back on your own, on your own efforts is always there like that little widow bothering you. Saying, be practical. Be down to earth about this. I mean, God doesn't want to deal with this little situation in your life. He's too busy for that, right? He doesn't have time for this little stuff. Just take the big stuff to him. Just use your own wisdom on this one, right? That temptation is always there. Be practical and to not have faith. So we have to have the, the, the belief to have faith and then the discipline to follow through. In a, a debate years ago between Tony Campolo and Dr. Paul Evan Bureau, the prominent God is dead philosopher, remember seeing that movie? God is dead and hearing him saying the, the proclamation on the cover of Time magazine that he announced that God is dead? Well, Tony Campolo and he had a debate. And Mr. Van Buren challenged Tony. He said, Tony, why don't you build an altar in the middle of this campus that we're arguing on, soak it with water like Elijah, and call down fire from heaven to consume it. Then you would have some empirical proof that God exists. There's the challenge. Mr. Campolo responded, Suppose I did that and fire really came down and consumed the pile of wood, what would you say, Mr. Van Buren? And he'd say, he looked at him and he wryly smiled and he said, I would simply say this, there must be some other explanation. Anthony Flew once described two men who walked through a forest, the same forest, the same path, the same time. The believer points to some beautiful wildflowers and says, there must be a gardener here. Look at those beautiful flowers. And the cynic responds, there's no gardener here. Look at all the weeds. When you decide to believe, your picture of the world changes. You can believe or you can be cynical. When you look at things, when you look at someone, when you look at a situation or a circumstance, what do you see? Do you see beauty and God's handiwork? Or do you see weeds and failures? You see, that's why deciding to believe is so important because it changes your outlook on life. John 7, 17 says, If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teachings come from God or whether I speak on my own. And Deuteronomy 4, 29 tells us, If you, it's personal, if you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you look for him with all your heart so when I say the first thing is you have to decide to believe it's not as simple as it sounds because you have to decide not to be cynical pragmatic and see all the faults and other reasons in the world number two you need to go to where faith is second step is you go where faith is active and living and working you hang out with 
people of faith that you respect, you talk to them, you ask them questions about their faith and how they believe, you ask them how do they have such a great mountain of faith in their life, ask them about their struggles and how faith helped them to overcome those struggles and why they are so joyful. This is another reason why regular fellowship in a local church is so important because in that fellowship on a regular basis you have people of great faith and you can lean, learn from them and glean from them and talk to them that you may learn how to motivate and use your faith as well. You'll see them and observe how they do and you may not have all the answers but you'll learn from them how to activate your faith. Number three, clarify the object of your faith. Clarify the object of your faith. One of the most important things about faith is whom do you have faith in? That gives it the authority or the lack of authority. If you have faith in yourself over God, who are you going to trust in most? Yourself. If you have faith in someone else or something, you're going to have faith in that over God. Whom you have faith in, what you have faith in, matters. And that may sound simple to say, clarify the object of your faith. Well, of course, it's a Sunday school answer. It's Jesus. But does your life reflect that? Do your actions, do your thoughts reflect that you truly have Jesus as the object of your faith? That's more the question. You see, Christianity isn't true because it works. Christianity works because it's true. Most often we have a cynical thought process that says seeing is believing. It's funny because the Bible says seeing is a waste of your time. And blessed are those who have not seen and yet what? Believe. So we got to take this worldly seeing is believing mentality out saying, well, if Christianity, I mean, how many people have you said, well, if Christianity really works, then why does this and this and this? It's like, well, because people fail. But you need to realize that Christianity works because it is true. We don't make Christianity true because it, we think it works, right? It's the other way around. It's believing without seeing. That's the basis of faith, right? It's believing without seeing. Hebrews 11 is filled with the stories of faith if you want to get a grip on your faith. But little doubts can wreck your faith tiny little doubts. Like Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, doubts are like what? Ants. ants in your pants that just mess up your faith, right? It's just even one little ant. I mean, we're sitting here having what we call lunch on the veranda yesterday in the middle of yard work and there was a little spider and it was only one little spider, but someone sitting next to me, namely my wife, was like, ah! And it was one little spider several feet away from her. Little things can wreak havoc on our faith. I think you've all heard me tell about my first ice fishing story to Blue Mesa Reservoir when I was about 20 years old, right? I go out. Intellectually, I know the ice is five or six inches thick, which means it's well enough to support my weight, especially then because I was half the man I am now, weight-wise. I knew it could support my weight. In fact, I knew five to six inches could actually support a truck. So I get out there in my little Oompa Loompa suit, my little pail, and my little fishing rod, and I go out to drill my hole in the ice, and I get about 20, 30 feet from the shore, and the ice began to speak. Now, if you've never been ice fishing, the ice speaks. What happens is when the ice is there on top and the currents are still flowing be below, the ice cracks and pops. It doesn't mean it's going to shatter or break. It just from the tension of all that water moving, it cracks and it pops. Well, intellectually, I knew the ice was what? Thick enough to hold me. But in my little doubt, when I heard that first crackle and pop, I thought I was what? Going down. And there's nothing funnier than seeing a 20-year-old Oompa Loompa in his snowsuit, dropping everything, trying to run on ice, which you cannot run on ice, by the way. Did you know that? You cannot crawl your way out of ice either. You just get ice under your fingernails as you're scraping and trying to get back to shore. And this guy is laughing and laughing and laughing because he knows what's going on. Finally, through all that struggle, somewhere in my mind, I reactivated my intellect and said, uh, what are you doing? You look like an idiot. This ice will hold you. And I humbly got back up and gathered my stuff, went out and dug my hole and fished. Took one crack, 
one pop of the ice to overcome what I knew intellectually. And it wasn't, I was never in any danger at all. So what's the point in clarifying the object of our faith? We have to have this Jesus and focus on that and know who he is so that when those little crackles and pop of life comes, we don't abandon what we know intellectually and who we know salvationally and run, right? You all know it. I mean, you've had a great mountaintop Christian experience. You're on a spiritual high and someone says one word and you're like, the faith air is just let out of your balloon, right? Took one comment, one thing, and you allowed that to overcome the great faith and spiritual high that you do intellectually. The question is, why did you do that? You knew better. Why do you let it get to you? You know better, right? We've all done that. Just that one little thing just fizzled the spiritual air out of our balloon. And then we look at that deflated balloon of faith and we're like, well, that was not smart. That was not a good decision, right? That's why we need to keep our focus on the person of our faith, which is who? Jesus the Christ. Finally, and fourth, you gotta risk something. You gotta risk something. That means you have to get out of what zone? The comfort zone, which feels so nice and relaxed and warm and cuddly. It's like being on a cold, rainy winter, fall day, and you look out and the leaves are changing and the wind's blowing and you know it's cold out there, but you're up tucked in a nice little warm comforter on your favorite recliner with a little fake fire going, and you've got some cookies over here with a little hot chocolate, with a little mint in it, right? And life is good. Why in the world would you leave that spot? Well, in faith, you gotta risk something because true faith requires you to do something, not just believe something. Believing is not enough. Jesus says, now go and do. Two issues that mess us up most with going and doing that really challenge our faith because they are the gods of this world. Do you know what they are? What are two of the big gods of this world? What's the bumper sticker on the car? He who dies with the most stuff wins, right? Materialism and money. Do you know that God will test your faith more than any two areas of your life in materialism and money because those are the gods of this world? Isn't that what our world is seeking? A bigger, better house. I mean, I, I love driving through, well, actually I don't love it. It kind of puts me off, but you drive through Bountiful sometimes and you see these one, two little room houses that were the original houses years ago, and then someone's bought the next three lots next to it and built a mansion that's four feet tall, and it's huge, and we've got like two people living in there, right? Because we've got to have more, we've got to have bigger, we've got to have better. We've got to have a newer something, right? Or money. Now, when I say risk something, I don't mean don't go and do something idiotic. Like when I say, I want you to test your faith today. Tara, don't run out and bountiful in the middle of I-15 just walking up and saying, well, God will protect me, right? That's not wisdom, right? There's a difference between not having wisdom and enacting your faith. I mean, do something in your faith that will stretch you spiritually. Get you out of your comfort zone. Go work at a homeless shelter for a while. Tithe. Hmm. Do a special offering with the money you're gonna buy something with for yourself. Lead a Bible study, not just attend a Bible study, lead a Bible study. Well, doesn't that sound like fun? Yeah. Go and do a new ministry. Do something for God that you haven't done before. That's gonna stretch your faith a little bit. It's gonna exercise your faith because you and I don't need more faith. We just need to exercise the what? Faith that we have. It's like working out. We've gotta stretch that muscle a little bit to make it grow. Speaking of money, you guys have heard me share the story that when Christy and I were first married, I was a youth minister, hired staff in the church, and yet I struggled with something, tithing. Now we put a few bucks in the offering every Sunday, but I told myself that we're young, we're poor, we don't have any money, we're only making $16,000 a year, we gotta pay for this little shanty that we live in and all the food and other stuff. 
there's just not enough left at the end of the month to tithe. Well, much. 10%, much less give sacrificially. No, that's why God had me marry Christy, because she kept coming back and saying, I really want to tithe. I really want to tithe. I really want to tithe. And finally, I broke down reluctantly. She kept coming back and coming back. And like the judge, I just did it. I learned something. The week after I tithed, I was anticipating what? We're not going to have money for anything. We're going to starve. We're going to be hungry. We can't pay the bills. We're going to have to declare bankruptcy this next week. Well, you know what happened? None of that. In fact, somewhere, we had excess. And I thought, well, if it did it the first week, maybe it'll work the second week, too. Starting to exercise a little faith here, huh? So we tithe. Guess what? We didn't go bankrupt. We didn't go without. Somehow, we were always provided for. Somehow we always found a bargain or a special or someone gave us something. Something just fell into our hands. God did exactly what he said he would do when I enacted my faith as the head of my household. J. Edwin Orr, college professor, would often ask his students, do you believe in marriage? And they would say what? Yeah. He'd say, why do you believe in marriage? And they'd say, because it gives stability to a physical relationship and it proves the best context for raising children and provides relief from loneliness without another person in your life. The professor would look at him and say, well, you're married then? And they're like, well, no, I'm not married. He would say, but if you really believe in marriage, then it could be said that you are married. And they'd say, well, I don't have a spouse. I haven't made that commitment. And the professor would say, precisely. It's not enough to believe, you have to make the commitment. And it has to be with somebody that you make that commitment. In other words, what he was saying was, you really don't believe in marriage because you're what? You're not married. If you really believed in marriage, you'd make the commitment. And biblically, a marriage commitment is only for how long? Three and a half weeks, right? Two, two years with an Oldman statement? It's how long? It's for life. And it's with someone. When we enact our faith and risk something, we are saying to Jesus, I believe you. When I'm crying out on that ledge and holding onto that root saying, help. And the Lord comes and says, I see you. I'm with you. I want you to do exactly what I tell you to do. And we say, what's that, Lord? And Jesus says, let go of the root. We have to make a decision whether we're going to enact our faith, do it, and trust him, or be cynical and cry out, is there anybody else out there? Right? That's what faith is. Psalm 34, 8 is like what Ellen read this morning. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. In other words, he will not fail you. So we close our message today before we pray with the very question that Jesus asked 2,000 years ago as we apply it to our lives. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the challenging stories, Lord, that we don't just quickly skim over them, but we dig into them and see what you have in there for us to learn and to grow. We pray, Lord, that you would move with your Holy Spirit, enable us to get beyond our intellect, enable us to get beyond the point of our own pragmatism and, and cynicism and trusting in ourselves and letting little things destroy what you have blessed us with, little insignificant things that really don't matter. Lord, we pray for wisdom, because your word says if we lack wisdom to simply ask and we will be given, we pray for wisdom to learn how to activate and enable the faith which you have given us, that we may amaze you and please you and show that we believe you. To you be the glory in Jesus' name.